Hello and welcome to this Automation World, Design World, and Packaging World webcast sponsored by Omron uh, entitled Pushing the Envelope with Machine Automation Controllers. I'm Gary Mitchell. I'm co-founder and editor-in-chief of Automation World and today's moderator. In this webcast we're going to learn what an MAC is and uh, and a little bit about how it's used. Our panelists today come from three different organizations and uh, we'll have uh, speaking from Omron Automation and Safety, Sean Adams, who's Director of Sales and Support Services, and we have um, Miguel Mercedes, who's Key Accounts Manager at Omron. And speaking about real-world applications, we have uh, from CrossCore Technology Incorporated, panelists Wally Lowe, who's founder and president, and Bill Strader, who's director of engineering. And finally, from MTS Medication Technologies, we have Mark Sweet, who's a controls engineer, Jason Stebbins, who's a controls engineer, and Lonnie West, who's a senior software engineer, all in packaging automation for MTS. The, uh, you, may, you may ask, what is an MAC? And it's a, it's a new concept uh, put forward by Omron. It's called a machine automation controller. And one of the things that's going on in the world these days of control is, is integration. Is how can we get integrated and synchronized better all the various disciplines that go into machine control. Uh, for example, you, you're familiar with just a typical p controller type of thing, but also we integrate motion and into this thing and vision and information and lots of things get integrated all together and so what companies have been working on is how can I put this into a package such that it's easier for you know end users and engineers to put together into a system. There is a white paper that covers this uh, technology. You can find it at automationworld.com and uh, in other articles that have been written in, in among other places, Automation World of course, uh, that recap this whole thing. The, uh, interestingly enough, I just listened to an economist from the uh, Federal Reserve talk about uh, manufacturing productivity, and there was an inflection point that happened in 1979 with the concept of uh, or the bringing in of the PLC, or Programmable Logic Controller. And that really helped productivity for several years until we needed something new, and so then uh, a concept was put forward called a PAC, or Programmable Automation Controller, and that integrated information and some motion into the uh, logic controller. And then we started adding safety control and started integrating safety into that. So you can see step by step by step we have gone into uh, integrating more and more things into that, uh, into that package, but we just keep needing more stuff, more functionality, more power out of the controller. And so the increased controller you know, leads to uh, the need for new technologies. And so therefore Omron has come up with this technology. It's a new platform. It's one controller with just one connection into one software. So you can do everything within your one software package to coordinate and integrate and synchronize all the various aspects of machine control. So to recap the MAC, and remember that phrase, MAC, it, it compares to existing controllers just simply by integrating more things. You can do more things in one package. You can synchronize much better and control up to 64 axes with a single, one single MAC. And we're also applying it into robotics, packaging, material handling, lots of functions into one controller and platform package. And now I believe we're going to toss it over to Sean, and, and, and Sean's going to take us a little deeper into the technology. So take it away, Sean. Hey, thanks, Gary. I appreciate uh, everybody being on today. And uh, we're certainly excited um, to uh, let you hear kind of the, uh, we call the voice of the customer uh, coming up and really have them give you a frontline view of really what we call reflections from the revolution. So just to, just to kind of catch you up, as, as Gary mentioned, you know, we, we introduced this technology uh, back in November in a global launch. And um, since that time, we've actually uh, added to the portfolio of products that have come, um, come about. Uh, we've actually introduced a new uh, processor that, that fits more of the four and the eight axes uh, controllers. The initial ones were 16, 32, and 64. Uh, we've expanded the I.O. We're still seeing a tremendous 
amount of adoption of third-party connectivity to EtherCAT. And uh, we're even seeing EtherCAT go further, further down uh, to the point level uh, with uh, our fiber sensors being directly connected onto, uh, onto the network. So uh, just the continued expansion of the technology and the products that are there to, to help, uh, help you solve your machine uh, application. We, um, um, we, we said this from the very beginning that you know, the, the NJ5 was the first of many. Um, we actually uh, now just come out with the NJ3, uh, same form, fit and function, but uh, uh, allows us to kind of look at a, more of that uh, mid-level market in the four to eight axes uh, count. So uh, certainly more, more later, but what I'd really like to get you to and talk about are some of uh, what we would really call the pioneers, you know, the innovators, the guys that are taking the new technology and, uh, and putting it to test. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have both uh, MTS and uh, cross-core technologies to join us. Um, as a lot of machine builders, as a lot of OEMs, they're very busy. They're, they're pushed uh, in a lot of directions. So we really think uh, it's wonderful that they can uh, take some time out of their busy schedules to uh, give us a little insight of, of what their thoughts are you know, on the technology. But um, it's kind of interesting when I was thinking about uh, this, uh, this webinar and a chance to talk to these guys uh, directly, I, I really equated a lot to a construction project. And, uh, and I often thought about the construction projects that I've been involved in. You know, to me, it's more exciting to see how the project is put together. So as I like to think of it, long before the drywall is installed, I like to see all the mechanical, uh, whether it's, you know, plumbing or electrical or uh, HVAC or low voltage or whatever the case may be, I, it's an exciting time to see the project. And we're in the same spot right here as uh, both MTS and CrossCore kind of put the drywall on, if you will, of their, their new machines. We get to see a peek inside of how they were able to do it. So um, it's kind of a fun, fun uh, position right now to, to take a look and, and hear directly from them. Um, so today, as we mentioned, um, we've got our three panelists. Um, so. Uh, Mark, Jason, and Lonnie, welcome. And uh, I guess uh, I guess Lonnie, um, tell us a little something about uh, MTS. Uh, give us a little background and history of your company. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, MTS was founded in uh, 1984. Uh, started as a homegrown company and uh, kind of moved into being an international provider of uh, med medication adherence packaging systems, which is to say we um, sell automation that packages pills into blister packs for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, we started off as a small company and we're now uh, international. We serve over 8,000 pharmacies, uh, have a line of over 20 different packaging machines and 50 types of consumable products. So you guys, uh, we're taking a look at, uh, you know, kind of your machine right here. Um, Give us a little uh, background of the machine and the architecture that we're, we're looking at right now. Okay, I'll, I'll throw that one over to Jason. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> All right, the particular, the particular machine, machine you're looking at is the Acuplex machine, which utilizes a Coliseum-type structure up on top to house and store the medication. Um, the robot grabs the medication by cassettes and drops them onto one of two feeder bases. The feeder bases are servo-driven, which distribute the pills into the configuration to drop into one of the blister packs, which is then presented to the operator. The operator uh, verifies the card, seals the card, and then delivers the card over to the conveyor where it's labeled. And from there, the card is shipped off to the appropriate pharmacy or um, medical institution for uh, distribution and consumption. So. So you guys are in the we're in the midst of, of really designing kind of the the next generation machine. So, kind of what were your goals for the, the new architecture? We have been using single controllers for I/O and single controllers for motion, um, a separate robot controller, and uh, all of our communications have been serial based up to this point. Now we have a fantastic opportunity to really drag it all into one controller, uh, one main machine controller, which can see and control everything, which will make troubleshooting a lot easier. It'll make programming a lot easier. It'll make seeing the machine, what's going on, you know, on an internal level, just that much smoother for us 
both putting it together and servicing it in the field. So you guys uh, obviously are kind of migrating from an existing architecture to a new one. How, how did you guys go about, you know, kind of choosing your control vendor? Um, that, that was not an easy uh, question for us to answer. In fact, it took us probably a good four or five months of really looking uh, across the field of automation providers to see what would be a good fit. Uh, we kind of broke it down to um, looking at several different vendors. We broke it down to the major ones that had an international presence because we don't ship just the United States. We needed uh, somebody that would uh, be able to support us in the UK, Australia, and all the other markets that we're in. Uh, so we basically made a decision matrix. Uh, we took a list of differentiating features to look at between uh, different vendors, and then we kind of rated those on priority-wise, what was more important to us as a company. And then we went through the process of interviewing, getting test equipment, um, putting hands on, playing with the software with all the different vendors until we came to a grade for each one, and this is uh, where we settled on Omron. So pretty extensive uh, research project that you did, you know, and, and by the looks of the matrix that we're showing a little glimpse of here, um, you said it took you quite a while to go through this, both the interview process and then coming up with the matrix, and you kind of settled on uh, Omron. Uh, but the, the other thing that uh, I think we had talked about earlier was the fact that you've got kind of this connectivity to the the enterprise or the pharmacy or the medical institution and then the machine level. Can you, uh, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our existing architecture that we've had in place for a while is all PC based, which means that the, the machine control and the pharmacy interface is all custom written software using Visual Studio and uh, moving to a machine automation controller really allowed us to kind of break apart that machine control from from the database interaction. So we're really allowing the, the machine controller to really kind of take on the, the heavy lifting part of the automation where it's responsible for all the motion and handling all the stuff that's physically moving around on the machines and really relegating the, the easy work, the operator interface and uh, data pump operations to Visual Studio. It uh, cleans up significantly our software architecture. And then how does, uh, how does the, uh, the machine automation controller, the Mac, then tie into the, the PC? Uh, is that a direct connect? Is it a network? How does that work? Well, everything's, uh, we've kind of moved to using uh, Ethernet um, for all our connections here. So, you know, the PCs connect via Ethernet to the uh, Omron controller. We're using the, uh, the Compilette package to be able to talk to the PLC. Um, we've moved all of our development to uh, Visual Studio.net, um, which gives us a lot uh, more capabilities and, you know, uh, <laughs> We have still have a lot of stuff in old VB6 code right now. Um, but yeah, connectivity is basically all Ethernet based. And then, you know, from the machine controller out, uh, we really kind of moved to EtherCAT to kind of take care of all our, you know, going down to I.O. and drives and devices in there, which has been a huge lifesaver so far. You guys, uh, you guys adopted some new technology uh, with the NJ5. Um, so, so tell me, what was, uh, what was one of the deciding factors? What was one of the things that weighed heavy on your mind when you looked at the, the NJ5 during your evaluation? Uh, ease of use. Yeah. Um, and the NJ programming software, the SysMac Studio, mm -hmm. we were able to drill down from one environment to everything connected to the the NJ controller, from the servo drives to the uh, the G9 safety controller to the point I/O, everything was visible from SysMac Studio, and it made it a lot easier for us so, to uh, do what yeah, we needed to put it. Yeah. So, so, what was the what was the learning curve like? I mean, because it, it is it was some new technology. You know, uh, was it something you guys self taught? Did you have to have training? What, how did you go through that? Oh, um, Omron, like the other vendors we uh, considered, brought in their demo package and um, 
Lonnie, Jason, and I sat down and uh, were given a uh, drive-through um, on how easy it was to use the software. Well, I had some issues with my um, laptop on installing the software, so I got started probably 45 minutes behind everybody else in the room, and I found it to be very intuitive on picking up what I needed to do. I was able to catch up with them in probably 15 minutes to where they were without having to interrupt them just from watching what uh, the Amron demonstrator was doing and um, what was on the screen. It was, it was really easy to pick up. I think one of the things that impressed me the, the most was really just the, the workflow within within uh, SysMac Studio. It's, it seems to, they've actually programmed, it looks like they programmed it with users in mind instead of engineers in mind. They, you know, how I would personally approach a project and configure and do things. Every time, you know, we, we've taken the step through there, it follows pretty much exactly the steps you would intuitively take as, as a software controls engineer in setting up a project. It's uh, seamless. Um, by far impressed us all. It was the most seamless package we've seen for this type of environment. What uh, what features do you think uh, you um, you use the most, or what 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 kind of surprised you a little bit? Or oh well, you know, coming from uh, you know myself, coming from the old old school PLC background, the ability of really uh, getting some good data structures inside of an automation controller and the integration with with uh, you know .NET development uh, has made a huge difference. In fact, it's kind of led us down this path of actually developing a recipe-based interface for our machines now, where we're actually able to uh, you know we've changed our, our upstream processing, so it may basically does a lot of the business logic and packaging decisions, and hands down a uh, you know a data structure recipe to the machine, and the machine actually handles taking care of. of producing uh, the product for us and letting us, you know, giving us back uh, statistics and everything on what we're doing. So that's that's been a big game changer for us. And uh, of course, you know, our existing architecture is really based uh, a lot around serial communication to multiple devices. So coming into either cat and the ability to have everything on one network that we can get to easily, uh, that's everything from reducing panel space and wiring to uh, saving time setting up and diagnostics has been a, a big, big uh, bonus for us as well. So you guys have uh, had a lot of experience in the past using Ethernet, um, but EtherCAT was relatively new to you, is that correct? We've got some experience using Ethernet IP. We don't have a ton of experience um, as far as an OEM goes, but we, we have integrated into previous machines. EtherCAT is still very new to us, but it already feels very comfortable for us to integrate that in. Why do you think it is that comfort level that you're seeing with EtherCAT being kind of a new technology? Well, for, for <laughs> if you've ever had to spend time trying to figure out why a computer is having problems talking serially to like 45 different RFID readers, you'll know the answer to that question. <laughs> Just the, the robustness of the network, uh, first off, uh, you know, once you get everything connected, Connected, uh, configuring everything as a snap, uh, the bandwidth of being able to transfer not just basic data but all kinds of advanced data and diagnostics to the network is a huge difference as well. And not to mention, you don't have to remember where the last serial device is oh, or string to put the man, main yeah. resistor on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, that's been my favorite thing so far of going to an uh, automation controller like this, getting rid of all the serial devices. So on the uh, on the EtherCAT, um, you, you mentioned something. I just want to I wanted to highlight again. You mentioned that because you were putting things on EtherCAT, you were able to reduce your panel space. Can can you talk about that? Sure. Our previous setups uh, were all serially, all discrete I/O. Going with the um, newer technology, we're able to drastically reduce our cabling and wiring. Um, we we utilize more remote I/O blocks. Uh, we and it it really cut down. We we reduced the machine paneling, I think by by two thirds, for our current machine design. So uh, from a, a support perspective, I got to be believe that's going to help quite a bit. Just the simplification of components and then the the wiring reduction uh, from. Uh, 
just troubleshooting, you know, the manufacturing, the operation. Um, what, have, what have your service people thought of it so far? Have they had a chance to look at the, the new architecture? Yeah, we've involved them in uh, some of our earlier proof of concept demos as we were evaluating equipment and everything. And uh, what, one of the big headaches of our current architecture, you know, uh, having a machine that's run from you know, a visual studio application is you don't have the ability to go in inside the machine while it's running live and see what it's actually doing. You're left with looking at log files or database transactions and kind of building up the picture after the fact. Um, one of the, the big things that they saw that the they're very excited about right now is the ability to, to log into a machine live as it's running and see the actual logic that's taking place of when things are going on. Just from a diagnostic standpoint, that is uh, such a savings in time. Hmm. So um, we mentioned you mentioned earlier too about you know connecting not only the drives, uh, the I/O, um, the other devices, but one of the ones you mentioned was uh, the, the safety controller. So could you talk to us about uh, what you guys deployed for kind of your safety circuitry and, and uh, what was your experience with that? Oh, in all our previous machines, we've uh, approached safety the way most everybody else does. Um, G-stop push button controller, a light curtain controller, guard door safety controller, they're all cross-wired into everything. and. Um, Really, one of the things I hate most about my job is trying to figure out what's wrong with the safety circuit. <laughs> and the, um, the ability to um, consolidate that entire safety wiring mess into the G9SP and then connect it to the NJ via Ethernet IP and basically run the entire safety circuit out of the machine in, out of one little box and then transfer that data to the, uh, the machine controller so it can be monitored is excellent. So um, we're looking at, uh, or at least we did show earlier, kind of the, this is the, the entire panel right here. This is, this is what you got down to. Circuit there. The, the, the safety controller and some uh, additional I.O. Okay. That for monitoring. And then that's tied back to the, uh, the machine automation controller via Ethernet? And, Ethernet, uh, yeah. Okay. We and do then all our light curtain muting in there. We, it's, it's great. So it's interesting because, you know, you, you're using a lot of, uh, uh, you know, factory automation technology. Uh, but your machines typically don't end up in a factory. Uh, do you see, what do you see the challenges with, you know, having that type of uh, environment to, to play in? Well, for, you know, hopefully for our, our customers, they're not going to see a lot of difference. Uh, you know, our, our hope is to really give them with a machine that uh, really has far fewer support issues and, and questions. Uh, our we're still using uh, Visual Studio.net as a development platform, but now it's going to be relegated to just being an operator interface for the machine, so we can focus a little bit more on giving them um, some good information about what's going on inside of the machine um, uh, and uh, really letting the automation controller handle the heavy work of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's about for So for operators of the machines, they really should just see a smoother operation. And, uh, you know, already on some of our proof and concept testing, too, we've been able to get um, actually quite a bit more throughput on our machines as well as we're able to optimize motion a little bit better on, on a you know, machine automation controller versus having a multiple threaded application written in Visual Studio running a machine. Hmm. So what's, uh, what's the current status of the machine right now? We're still in development. We're doing testing on the machine. We've already settled on the controller and the safety circuit. Now we're simply um, finishing off the loose ends and, and mapping out our I.O. And next is going to be assembly. Okay. And uh, you guys have had a chance to kind of take the machine automation controller, the SysMac Studio, and the uh, uh, EtherCAT kind of for a, a bit of a test spin. Um, where do you see it going next? What what uh, do you see any future plans that you'd like to tackle that maybe you, you didn't think of in the past with your prior architecture? 
Well, we are already looking at a couple of other machine designs that'll, that will utilize the same technology. Uh, we have the ability to go with multiple machines per pharmacy, though we haven't hit a customer who's required uh, that type of, that large type of automation requirement. So we have the ability, now we just need the customer. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of have the headroom to expand, but uh, uh, certainly you're going to be market driven with, with kind of customer demand. Um, right. A typical a pharmacist wants a small machine, so, and they usually only need or want one or two rather than a couple hundred. Right. Well, as that population continues to age, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, kind of the demands that we're going to need for kind of these blister pack and these individual uh, medicine uh, dispensing. It's just so critical uh, for so many people that to make sure that they take the proper amount of medicine. So it's a uh, it's an interesting kind of application that, that certainly affects uh, a vast majority of people as we uh, continue to see that population age. Um, so let me ask you the last question, Just to, uh, and I'm sure there's probably some machine builders on, on the line today. Um, what, what advice would you have for them? What, what uh, any sage uh, information that you'd, you'd like to pass along maybe to someone about uh, deploying this technology or just deploying new technology that maybe uh, pearls of wisdom you'd like to share? I, I guess all I can say is that uh, prior to us conducting the study, um, I was expecting kind of the same old, same old. I'd come from the classic TLC background and that's what I really thought the state of the industry was still at and was really amazed at how far the technology had come just for the ability to, to integrate, you know, servo motion and, you know, your classic PLC type controls and the object-oriented programming style like everybody's used to in .NET development into one package that seamlessly pulls it all together. Um, don't think it's your, your grandfather's PLC because it's not. <laughs> uh, well, well said, well said. Hey, Lonnie, Jason, Mark, can you guys just hang on in case we get some questions at the end? We'd certainly appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks. Hey, next up is uh, we've got uh, Wally and Bill uh, from Cross uh, Crosscore Technology. Uh, Wally, Bill, welcome. Thank Hi, Sean. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hey, so um, so Wally, if you could, maybe you could uh, start us off with uh, a little background on not only on your company, but if you could spend a few minutes and, and give us a little state of the industry uh, that you serve. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, we focus on a, a, a market segment within the global card industry related to high-speed card personalization. Now, this uh, involves a, a range of different processes that um, bring together a finished product that we're, most of us are familiar with today in the form of gift cards or membership cards, frequent flyer cards, health insurance ID cards, and hotel key cards and many others. Um, it's a very new market. It's only been around probably for eight years at best. And it's a classic case where new technology opened the door for new markets. Um, see, eight years ago, thermal transfer printing processes were the only uh, way to do this, but you could only produce one or 2,000 cards per hour. The paradigm today is if you can't produce 30,000 cards per hour, you're running slow. So. Um, our, our objective was to tie together the, the various technologies at first that, that, that gave us the end result of a, of a finished gift card, which is mag encoding, ink jetting, uh, high-speed labeling. And then along came the system controller to help us with data integrity in terms of uh, no mismatching or duplicate numbers. Uh, that, that became a priority because these cards are, are they have value to them. So that, that the focus there was to track the product as it moves through the system, utilize vision systems and or sensors or readers to verify each product. And, and from about 2005, 2006, that market really blossomed. Companies like Walmart, Best Buy, all the big box retailers really uh, jumped on the bandwagon with gift cards. Um, so for a period of time, there was just uh, build capacity as fast as we could. Um, about 2009, the economy slowed down, and, and technology, you know, it was time for it to take the next uh, sort of forward movement uh, because, of course, the big box retailers know how to, um, to 
drive competitive pricing. So our customers, they not, they not only needed capacity, but they needed better efficiency, uh, better quality, better can, you know, overall throughput with their equipment. And, and we recognized then that you know, with the install base of equipment that we had, that there was room for improvement on the mechanical side. But I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in measuring things. And we knew also that the automation control part of it could, could uh, play a big part. So that's what we started working on uh, front end in 2009. And then last year, we, we shifted gears to focus specifically on our, on our transport systems. And that's where we really started um, uh, gathering information, looking to see what tools were out there that would help us, help our customers, you know, better measure their production, um, better monitor the, the systems in order to reduce downtime, uh, reduce maintenance issues, give them the feedback uh, that they needed to, it, no matter how small or incremental improvement in efficiencies, we're talking about one, two, or five percent, everything counts at this stage. So. It, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer at this point in time. We've, we've done a lot of refining the, the, the mechanical processes, but now we, we need to focus on the, the next natural step, which is really making these systems communicate effectively for our customers and, um, and driving that efficiency into it. Um, we're a small company. We, we, it's a global industry, but because it is so specialized, we have we have mainly two competitors, but they're they're big fish. They're global multinational companies, and so when you're swimming in a pond with big fish, you you got to swim faster, and that's what our goal is with the with our next generation system is to really raise that bar. Uh, it's not a matter of just staying relevant; it's a matter of staying you know uh, ahead of the game, and, and that's what we've set out to do with the system, and, and we're very pleased with the results so far. So. You know, you also kind of had to go through a metamorphosis on the architecture. Um, so, what were what were really the goals? You know, that you guys set out to do with kind of your next generation machine. You know, architecturally, what what were you trying to accomplish? Well, what we've done for the past couple of years is is really try to listen to our customers, spend time, you know, on their production lines, observe their teams, and and watch how they've developed their own individual processes to make them more uh, quality driven or capable, um, more streamlined in their, in their processes. And, and we've, we've focused on you know, just trying to uh, understand what their processes were better because they're dynamic. Uh, it might change from one operation to the next, and um, they might have their own uh, uh, processes and procedures. Uh, but for us, the key point, well, we've always um, prided ourselves on it, where we, we know that uh, our customers know uh, more than we do uh, most of the times. Uh, so we, we try to, to use them as a sounding board, observe and listen, and then respond. That's the most important thing. So why did you guys, you know, you have a new architecture, kind of a brand new machine that's, that's shipping this summer. Um, you know, how did you guys uh, stumble upon or come upon Omron as a, as a controls vendor? Let me uh, let me let Bill address that one. He's probably best as okay. to go to the background there. Yeah, and and I had used Omron uh, for quite a number of years uh, previous to this project, and uh, was familiar with uh, their Trajectia system, and uh, had always uh, had very good support and uh, uh, you know reliability from the Omron product. So when this project came up. And we decided we were going to take this new platform to the next level. Uh, we certainly wanted to look at the automation controls in the in the same light. Um, uh, we didn't want it just to be uh, the same package that we've been dealing with forever. We wanted a platform that was going to be able to uh, we were going to be able to grow with, and uh, that was one of the reasons we started taking a look at the the MJ system. Um, and when we started taking a look at some of the features and support, uh, that was really kind of a driving factor. Uh, some of the, the Ethercat functions uh, and Ethernet uh, uh, capabilities with it were very, very important to us and felt it was important for um, how we want to take some of our not only steps on this machine, but our next steps. So you mentioned that. Uh, 
that you had used, you know, uh, Omron's uh, motion controller trajectia. Did you uh, did that help you in the learning curve? Uh, was there a benefit or or uh, or what? Yeah, there was certainly a benefit um, because you know we 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 knew what we could do with the trajectory system. Uh, even with the trajectory, we were still using that in combination with some PLC. Um, so being able to tie that all into one package certainly was nice. Um, there was a version of the, uh, the SysMac Studio with the trajectory as well. So I had certainly some familiarity with what we could expect. Now we've kind of taken this to kind of a whole new level and uh, frankly, we're we're still learning some of the uh, features of, of what we can do with this. And uh, like I say, we had some specific uh, needs in mind when we developed this machine. And uh, but we're kind of actually taking that to the next level now, where we're we're getting some benefits we really weren't even searching for in the beginning. So um, you know, you guys have a new controller, new architecture. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, when they first get their hands on a piece of software like SysMac Studio, uh, kind of that, you know, integrated development environment, or as we like to say, a true uh, integrated development environment. What, what was your impression of it? I mean, how did you, how was your learning curve? What was your experience with it? You know, how did you get trained uh, with the software? Yeah, for, yeah, frankly, and, uh, Amaran's engineers came in and worked with our guys in training, and uh, which was hugely important. I think that's probably a key thing. Uh, like the the guys from MTS had suggested that uh, you know it's, it's a pretty easy to learn system, um, but like any complicated, uh, powerful software, um, it, it seems to be as like one of those situations where. You know, when you go into this only looking at the tip of the iceberg, and uh, I think, frankly, uh, as a follow-up, once we've gone through this stage, I think we probably want to revisit some of the training again uh, now that we've got our feet a little bit more wet with it and uh, really drill down a little deeper into what we can do in the future with it as well. So the other, uh, the other part of, of your system, you know, as you kind of look at the you know, the panel that you have, it looks like you guys have uh, left some room for growth there. You know, certainly we would consider that very future proof from a panel size. Um, is that due to kind of modularity that you'd like to get, or, or do you have specific uh, space, you know, requirements for some of, some of that space? Well, um, here's what we, we, we put into this. Our, our, the current system, as you see it here, is sort of purpose-built for the old 80-20 rule. It'll, it'll allow our end users to capture 80% of the market, but it's very rare that they'll just buy that particular design. They're going to want uh, any one of our range of 12 different modules that we, we add onto these machines, and, and they might be in a unique configuration. Um, so we know we knew that going into it. So it was it was a you know just it, it all fell together pretty well. This um, this extra space you have here allows us to add several servos and, and variable flow drives to uh, expand and grow a system. And the other thing about the, that I really liked about it was that it, they might buy our base system today, but they don't have the business to justify one of the extended modules or a turnover unit or other stations right now. So uh, in, if they want to in 12 months, we simply have to add that unit to this box, run the cabling to those uh, additional peripherals or components, and it is a very smooth and fast integration. And, and that's, for us, I think versatility is one of the critical factors. And from my perspective, uh, that, that I, why I really like the NJ5 um, system. Another thing Bill didn't mention is we, we've We've done very well with our system controller to get remote access for technical support to uh, diagnose problems with the, the Max RAP encoder or other components on the system. We've never been able to do that with the with the power distribution and all the components themselves and the EtherCAT Ethernet IP uh, interface on the NJ gives us the ability to remotely access these systems and diagnose or assist our customers wherever they are, not to mention the global support that comes behind it. Right. 
and just to kind of add on to that, you know, as Wally mentioned earlier, we are a relatively small company in a in a global market, and so we don't have you know 20 techs in every city. Uh, you know, when we send somebody, we send them from Florida here, and uh, uh, if it's a upgrade to a machine, if a customer is going to add a component to the base module, uh, the Ethercat cat makes those remote installs much easier than they used to be. Um, and then, as Wally said too, just from a support standpoint, uh, having that ability to do a remote diagnostic is just huge for uh, you know customers that are having downtime issues and, and that sort of thing. So, Sean, um, this screen that you're showing here right now, this is one of the things I'm most excited about. Uh, these are a lot of the parameters and the counters and the maintenance cues that that are that are feeding information to the to operator to let them know what's happening with the system. Um, the, the first thing that we've never done before, obviously, is, is provide levels of uh, uh, control like this for the system. Uh, we can control the energy output to the, the blowers and to the, to the servo drives. Uh, um, one of the most critical things I think our customers are going to benefit from is a whole menu of counters that can be uh, set for this to allow them to monitor uh, production throughput for new mag encoding heads or inkjet heads and and the like and um, and what we're doing which is is truly interesting is that when you look at our customer base and, and what this machine can do on average they they'll run thirty thousand cards an hour twenty four hours a day They're, they are just built to run like that so but in reality uh, they're only operating at 50% capacity. Now, yes, a lot of that is related to job changeovers and new job setups and the dynamics involved there, but we know there's a lot of inefficiency that is being lost at, the, at, those, at, the, at that phase. Um, and what we're doing right now in phase one of this is just to monitor the energy consumption and, and correspond or compensate for those changes. And, uh, what we're seeing so far is up to a 50% reduction in energy uh, cost related to these production lines, and, that, and that's big. That, that's, a t that's one of the intangible benefits, but it's still significant. So, you know, it's funny because, you know, as we've learned about, or as I've learned about the machine that you guys are doing, at the end of the day, you're, you're really talking about currency. You know, it's, it's money that you're handling. It's not a... Um, uh, it, the, uh, you know, if you have a bad read on a card or a bad print on a card, um, you know, you just can't throw that in the in the bucket. I mean, that money has to be accounted for. Um, so, so talk to us about how that is uh, managed. You know, through your system, uh, kind of the kind of the entire uh, control of that is has got to be pretty rigid. It is. Yeah, Over the over years, that's been the the one jugular component that relates to it all. Um, this is a, a, every one of these, you know, units has dollars associated with them. It's not just a 13 cent plastic card. So a lot of that is, is uh, revolved around the system controller, um, the vision systems and whatnot. But uh, again, the, the, I think from a, from a data integrity part of the, the application, uh, it probably is not import, as important with the with the, the Mac or the NJ5, but what what's happening is that uh, our customers are being told by you know their customers, the WalMarts and the Best Buys of the world, that you know <clears throat> five years ago the, the QC standards that um, we had are, are not valid anymore. There there cannot be one missing card. They all have to be in sequence. They all have to be accounted for. Uh, and that drives up all the QC processes and affects their efficiency. So that's really been the big impact there. But at, at the end of the day, um, what you're talking about there has, has really netted out in a lot of mergers, acquisitions, even bankruptcies in our customer base. So they're really getting smart because they have to. And uh, it is, it's, it's serious business today. Yeah, it, it, relative to the transport on that, Sean, uh, and, and how that plays into that, is like I say, there's there's a lot of re redundant systems that are going on in the controller as far as uh, verifying card location on the machine and, and camera verification of the print and that sort of thing. Um, 
the bottom line from a throughput standpoint, uh, the better we can make the transport run, the less problems there are in those areas from a reject and downtime standpoint. And mm. that's where some of the diagnostics we get out of the, the NJ uh, really help us hone in on that. Uh, matter of fact, on the screen you have up there, you, you see a, a, a torque uh, percentage down there uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, that is something that we're monitoring on this system that's kind of unheard of on a, on a line like ours where we're really looking at uh, low torque, high torque, and if we go on out of a certain range, we'll throw up a flag uh, that lets you know maintenance people know that something's not quite up to par. Uh, because mm. those are situations where car jams happen and, and uh, things of that nature happen. So we're, we're trying to give our customers some tools to uh, uh, stay ahead of the game a little bit more rather than waiting for something to break. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because you guys have made extensive use out of the uh, HMI. The, the question that, uh, that begs is, did you guys take advantage of some of the built-in diagnostic screens, you know, for the NJ system, um, you know, during the design and development phase? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, th those have been very helpful and in, in time-saving and helping us, you know, set up our program and doing troubleshooting and, you know, that sort of thing. So there, there's, uh, and like I say, we're still learning even what, what a lot of the things we can do with that, but uh, it certainly has been uh, much easier to use from, you know, previous uh, systems that we've used. And if I may, um, it, Bill talks about us still learning. I mean, there, the, the QC processes that each and one of our customers implemented their facility, they're going to be unique in some shape, form, or fashion. And we know that uh, once they get their hands on this, they're going to say, wow, can we do this? Can we do that? And that that's the thing that really got uh, my attention with the NJ is that yes, the answer is yes in most cases because it is so easy to interface to upgrade and program. Um, it gives us the, you know, the, the optimum versatility. And we're, you know, we're we're still learning on it. Like Bill says, we did have a couple of, you know, um, points in time where we were, um, you know, working hard to catch up with the new programming language and whatnot. But those were, you know, typical new product development cues. Um, but really, the, the the versatility of this is phenomenal. It, we're, we we don't we don't even know. Uh, what we got ourselves into, I, I'm, I'm sure we're in just chapter one of, with this first uh, phase. So where where does the project stand right now? Where are you guys uh, at from a release standpoint um, and a uh, project completion? System one is done, and uh, we're releasing it this uh, first part of June. And uh, we're now going from the what I call the engineering phase to the execution phase, so bringing together all the assembly and build processes, the parts, the diagrams and drawings, and getting a, a smooth flow of, of, of manufacturing so we can start delivering these systems as efficiently as, as possible. This is, a, this is a time of year where our customers really ramp up their capacity because the second part of the year is really dedicated to production. Hmm. So, um Kind of a similar question, you know. You guys have you guys have uh, been one of the, the pioneers, the innovators uh, that have taken some new technology, applied it to your next generation, you know, new architecture machine. Um, what, what would be some of your uh, thoughts to other machine uh, builders, manufacturers, designers, uh, you know, with some of the stuff that you've gone through? Well, you know, I say go for it because in, in today's economy. Um, even if you're pointed in the right direction, you're going to get run over if you're not moving forward. So you have to continue to push the envelope through technology releases like this. Um, that's 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 our mantra today, uh, especially swimming in a, a pond with big fish. Bill, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and and I would say too, the one thing that I've been really pleased with uh, is. Uh, you know, some of the learning curve problems we've had have been typically, uh, uh, you know, uh, just syntax errors and things like that in programming that maybe have, uh, you know, bottled us up for a little bit. But uh, 
the the SimSac Studio it seems to be very reliable in catching bugs, you know, before they're really downloaded and part of the machine. Uh, I know in the old trajectory system, every now and then we would run into certain error conditions and things like that would really kind of put it in the kind of fits. And uh, I haven't seen any of that with the NJ. If it doesn't work, it basically uh, won't, doesn't let you download program into the system. It, it's, it's very good up front in uh, doing the diagnostics work. So, so Wally, you, you've uh, I heard you say this, and, and it was uh, it kind of struck a chord with me because you you said you've had a, a pretty good team of people in there. Uh, to help you make this uh, next project, you know, kind of come out on schedule, and you guys are, are moving forward with that. But um, you know, as you guys look to the future, uh, what do you see uh, your next big steps uh, becoming? Hmm. Well, um, we are we're going to focus solely on this segment of the card industry. There's there's where we have an advantage as a, as a small company. We don't try to do too many things. Our our, our our competition is they 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 a much larger umbrella of product lines they're trying to support, and uh, we're going to stay focused uh, on this market for our customers. We have a number of different uh, engineering innovations on the drawing board now, which they basically will allow us to uh, to expand this market into um, other areas that. Uh, products are useful for the direct mail industries uh, and a lot of the, the attaching and inserting type functions that you might see in um, cards affixed to letters as they're inserted in envelopes and mailed to you at home but uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep a, a very narrow focus because uh, we, we want to be the best at what we do and um, and we rely we have to because all of our areas of technology are very specialized we have to we rely on all of our team players, like Omron and, and, and our inkjet system controller suppliers. Uh, they, they're part of our team uh, to make this a successful integration, and um, and that's what makes us. Uh, uh, that's what makes things successful for us and for our customers mainly. Yeah, and, and relative to the motion control stuff, we do have projects in the pipeline that are basically add-ons to this for things like duplex printing where it would add additional transport. Uh, Wally mentioned like tipping cards on to uh, your mailers and things of that nature. So those are those are some of our next steps in the motion control part of this project. Guys, thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule and, and spending with us today. Um, if you can just hang on, there might be a couple questions. Gary, I'm going to turn it back to you. And uh, certainly we'd like to open it up for uh, any questions our audience might have. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Gary back Gary again. Back. And yeah. there's a, uh, a spot in your screen if you want to ask some questions. We have a couple, and we have time for just a couple. And I, I thought it would be useful looking at the questions and just otherwise. We covered a lot of territory, and it looks like you guys really did some fantastic machine design here. And I, I just thought it would be very useful for the listeners to maybe summarize a little bit. Um, you know, we talked about the power of the MAC was in the integration and uh, synchronization of all the different components. Is it possible just to, to make it clearer to the, to the readers just exactly what all components you, you, you guys did as you use this new system? Gary, who are you directing that question to? Actually, it could go to anybody, uh, but I think both of the, uh, probably the engineers, um, just, you know, if you could just summarize, like, you, you, you did uh, HMIs, drives, um, you know, what, what of the things did you do, just really quickly, to make it clear to people that all these different components can uh, be integrated, and Sean, I'm, I think you have people there, too, that can chime in sure. as far as the things that you can integrate in there. Lonnie, why don't you give us your list, if you can, real quick. Uh, certainly, uh, on our machines, uh, we're interfacing in with uh, barcode readers, FANUC robots, um, I/O, uh, temperature controllers. Um, uh, gosh, what else we got, Jason? I'm trying to servo drives. Servo drives. Oh, got a servo stepper, safety controllers. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill, 
Can you give yeah. us uh, your uh, maybe quick yeah, laundry list? Uh, yeah, certainly on our end, you know, uh, obviously we're driving the machine, so we have a servo drive for our main transport because we require very accurate transport, uh, but it also ties into uh, some other smaller AC drives that are on the machine. Uh, some of the other things that are, are pretty unique to our product that uh, the ANJ helped us with quite a bit was uh, uh, our, our transports, our, our vacuum transports for holding the product in place uh, as, as they're moving through at high speeds. And uh, one of the challenges has always been you either, when you're doing remake cards or reject cards or where you're starting the product, you don't have enough vacuum to hold down the card or you put it in such a large vacuum system that once you get the deck loaded up, it really puts a strain on everything. So we incorporated a uh, vacuum transducer in through the NJ where we get an analog signal to it and then run that to control a variable frequency drive to maintain a constant level of vacuum, uh, which helps on belt wear, it helps on drive load, it helps on energy consumption, that sort of thing. Uh, you have some safety features in from uh, uh, some uh, chill functions that we have on our LED lamp to make sure we have enough chill water flow, temperature control, uh, and I mentioned doing some torque, torque monitoring, those sorts of things. So those, those are some of the things that we've incorporated that are uh, unique and new for us. So, sounds good. Um, we only have a couple of minutes. I, I thought I'd ask, I'm an editor, so I, I get to ask these harder questions or maybe unfair, but um, I, I, I'm impressed. I, I, I was a machine builder in my life, and I'm impressed with the machines, but I'm wondering, uh, incorporating all the things you guys talked about uh, with the software and programming and putting all the components together, it looks like that, uh, to me, that this should make you um, more competitive versus your 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 competition, and I'm just curious if you could uh, just in the in the last minute and a half that we have or so, um, just you know maybe first Wally and then and then um, um, uh, I'm not really sure who on the other team, but uh, you know how does this make you more competitive? Do you feel like I'm more competitive against the uh, the market now with uh, uh, new designs here? Well, it it does. There's no doubt about it. We're the first company to do something like this, and it was the natural evolution of these product lines. Remember, I mean, in the early days, we were just trying to strap components onto a vacuum transport and make you know something happen. And then system controllers gave us a little bit uh, increased data integrity as related to all that. But uh, it was it's a natural uh, progression of of our type of equipment to have everything perfectly integrated into a, an automation controller like this because once you get to this level now you're working on incremental percentages of profitability and productivity those are the key drivers that are going to keep our customers successful and ahead of the game in, in the industry and uh, and that's it's it's, it's 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 you know the margins everything else all that's been uh, fleshed out now it is it is uh, only the strongest survive, and and uh, this is going to put them in position to really be masters of their domain in that sense, because they will they will have maximum flexibility and versatility with this equipment, and uh, and we're going to help them drive that uh, predict productivity and the efficiency increases through it, no doubt about it. Yeah, I don't really have a whole lot more to add to what he said right there. That was pretty much summed it up perfectly. It really comes down to efficiency of the machine and, and reduced support time on our end, and uh, this is going to bring both to us. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely going to improve you know, productivity and support on our end. Well, that, that, that's good to know. That's, uh, there's, there's, actually, there's no reason to automate, I suppose, if it doesn't improve you, and, and it sounds like you guys have uh, really utilized this uh, MAC concept and, and all the products uh, very well. Um, before I wrap it up, Sean, did you have any last remark or I'll just wrap up? No, we just want to again thank our panelists uh, for joining us. We, we know how hectic their schedules are and, and if I could just maybe uh, throw a shout out to Miguel who, uh, who helped uh, really pull this together for us. Um, I just want to say thanks, but we're, we're good. We really appreciate the time from everybody.
Okay, and one, one last thing that everybody should know is this, uh, this webcast will be archived, so you can go to uh, automationworld.com or to Design World or Packaging World and find, the, uh, find an archived version of, of this. So tell your friends and neighbors that didn't, uh, didn't catch it live, hey, there's still a chance to listen to all this and learn about this new classification of machine automation control. And uh, so this is Gary Mitchell, Editor-in-Chief, Automation World Magazine, saying thank you for attending this, and goodbye. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everyone.